For the next 45 minutes, I'll be discussing. I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. I thank the, uh, the organizing committee tremendously for this honor to be speaking. Uh, I'm totally robotic, left in Sigmoid, collect me. What I'd like to do in this talk basically is not rehash what has been already expertly discussed by my, um, these giants in colorectal surgery, but rather um, talk about how best to do this procedure robotically. And I'm sorry I'm out of breath, the 15 feet that I just walked, but uh, we'll go to the next slide. My disclosures are I'm a speaker for intuitive surgical and run courses as well. When it comes to <clears throat> um, the discussion of left hemicolectomy or sigmoid section, we're really talking about anything from the level of the splenic flexure down to the peritoneal flexion. And it has already been expertly discussed. Um, there are multiple ways to do this procedure, but when it comes to robotic surgery, there are some significant differences. I mean, there are certainly benefits to doing it robotically. There are benefits also to doing it laparoscopically. From a pure data standpoint, um, once you're past your learning curve uh, from a robotic standpoint, there are some perceived benefits by the data as well as from, um, from the, the anecdotal side of things. When it comes to robotic surgery, when you compare it to laparoscopic surgery, depending upon where you're looking, who you're talking to, and what data you're actually looking at, there actually is a decreased conversion rate to open in the robotic subgroup when you compare it to uh, laparoscopy. Shorter length of stay is seen in some studies, but there's really no difference in a lot of studies. Um, there are some studies to show an increased lymph node harvest in the robotic group, also an improved rectal cancer team equality in some studies, but the majority of the studies, which I don't reference in this table, actually show that the TME quality is pretty equivalent across the uh, laparoscopic and robotic subgroups. When it looks at pain, it's pretty equivalent across um, uh, the laparoscopic and robotic group. Faster GI return to function is pretty equivalent as well. Reduced hernia rate is also seen in robotic subgroups, but it's nothing magical about a robot. A bad surgeon on a robot is still a bad surgeon. So this thing does nothing but amplify who you are who you are and what you're able to do. And certainly when you're initially starting out, absolutely shorter operative times when you're laparoscopic group because we're just better at doing it. So what I'd like to do is break down the robotic left-sided resection into 21 steps. And we do this for left lower, lower, lower tier resections, for right hemicolectomies. When we do this, it allows you to segment the operation into digestible chunks because when you do a laparoscopic operation, you can easily crush it, start the splenic flexure, then go to the pelvis and go lateral, medial, medial, lateral, you can go really whatever. But robotically, you'll be there for a week trying to do the operation without some sort of structure to it. So when it comes to a robotic case, you really got to start by, number one, position the patient. Number two, access and insufflate the abdomen. Step three, place your pores. And we'll talk about some of these steps in detail. Explore the abdomen, position the bowel, it's, uh, initiate the dissection, identify the hypogastric nerves, identify the left ureter, divide the IMA, divide the IMV if appropriate, take down a splenic flexure if it's appropriate, laterally mobilize the descending sigmoid colon. If mesorectal mobilization is indicated, please do so at this point. Sharp dissection in the distal division, and this is where it gets fun, sharply divide the proximal uh, portion. Um, then you actually, we're going to talk about some EEA anvil placements and intracorporeal anvil techniques where you transiently then extract the specimen, secure your proximal anvil around the conduit and then set up for your anastomosis and we close the patient at step 21. So this is a, a downloadable PDF if you go to that QR code. But what I'm going to do now is break it down into these digestible chunks and speak specifically about the robotic approach. So when it comes to step three, place your ports, let's hit this very detailed. This is a selfie I took this morning, and basically if you look, if you can divide the abdomen into its quadrants where you put some landmarks, <laughs> defining the subcostal margins and the ASIS, typically what I'll do in these operations is I'll fear for the ASIS and basically go two to four centimeters medial, I'm sorry, four to six centimeters medial to the ASIS, and just immediately to the left of the falciform ligament, and I'll draw a straight line between the two, and along that trajectory, I'll place my robotic ports. And they look kind of like that, with an assist port basically in the right upper quadrant. Now, of course, this will go up or down, medial to lateral. It, it just kind of varies depending on the body habitus and the scars of the patient. But roughly speaking, on average, this is kind of what it looks like. For my SI colleagues, this is pretty much what you can do also to have pretty good access to the splenic flexure. And when it comes to now back to this diagram, 
I cannot overstress the fact that once you start doing robotic surgery, you will hate yourself if you don't adhere to step five where you position bowel prior to docking the robot. I say don't even look at the robot before the bowel has been positioned. Then step six is when we initiate the dissection. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this because so many surgeons have done such a great job this morning, but I do wanna point out one thing here, that when you're doing this dissection, I had tremendous difficulty in identifying exactly where to begin the medial to lateral dissection. So I wanna show you here that basically, this is the mesorectum being tented up with a third arm of the robot. This is arm number two and arm number, uh, sorry, arm number two and arm number one. So my left and right hand, if you can see here, there's some yellowish fat there and some more pinkish salmon-y looking fat in the retroperitoneum. And I'm just kind of jiggling the peritoneum and basically you'll be, you'll be able to predict exactly where to make the incision for the medial to lateral dissection. Zoom in real tight. And you can see right there, yellowish fat, more pinkish salmon-y fat, right at that junction. That's exactly where you make your dissection. That's where that pneumoperitoneum then uh, hits. And you'll, in just a second, you'll see your order, but I'll fast forward for in, in the interest of time. Uh, skipping now to, um, I can't even see what step on, step nine, uh, dividing the IMA and IMV. I'm not going to go into tremendous detail on this, but basically the, the crux that I want to show here is for robotic control to, to master this part of the operation, it's all about triangulation of the arms. So when it comes to the third arm, the third arm is holding at the 12 o'clock position holding north. Your left hand is holding basically in the left lower and right hand is in the right lower. So you're really doing everything you can to triangulate the positioning to give you that beautiful exposure that you can get. So I'm not gonna show the actual division here because we've, we've seen some beautiful demonstrations, but suffice it to say that exposure is critical on these the steps of the operation. Splenic flexion mobilization. Just saw Yope, no, my God, he never ceases to amaze me with his videos. I'm not gonna show necessarily how to take the splenic flexure down, but I will say that when you do this robotically, sometimes it's miserable. Sometimes you can't get the robot to get all the way up to the left upper quadrant. So what you do in these instances, especially with the XI robot, is when the arms are positioned in a linear configuration, what you do, actually you can see my fellow here, you can see the robotic arms are now docked to the patient's left lower quadrant. Watch what we do. Once you get to the splenic flexure and you're dying because you can't rotate anymore, you then pivot the, what's called the flex joints up to the left upper quadrant. In other words, towards the splenic flexure, rotate everything up as high as you can go. And what this allows you to do is essentially dunk underneath yourself. You can then invert yourself um, in essentially 180 degree fashion to thereby take the splenic flexure down. So if you ever get stuck in a situation where you need more lateral mobilization, this is the key to do here. Move along to step 13 for the mesorectal mobilization if appropriate. Really, this is just going to show a hand over hand technique where basically you position the mesorectum with your left and right hand, get it exposed exactly as you want it. And then with your third arm, the tip up grasper, you never come above. Look at that internal collision. You always want to come below yourself and lift up with the tip up pointing away from you like a parks retractor. And it makes it look just this way every single time. So never exchange the instrument from above the third arm, but rather below it. This gets you set up perfectly to do your TME at this point. Step 15 is a proximal division. Actually, I'm going to take step 14 to 19 in one chunk, which is really talking about transanal excision, intracorporeal anastomosis very briefly, because we have a great talk on that. When it comes to doing the anastomosis, we have a couple options. The question I always ask is, does an EEA stapler reach? If the answer is no, like it's a splenic flexure resection, you're way up in the left upper quadrant, just do the anastomosis as an iso or anti-peristaltic anastomosis, side to side, whether it's, um, whether it's however you want to do it. If an EEA stapler does reach it, you have the option to do an intracorporeal anastomosis versus extracorporealize it like we traditionally do. Now I'm going to show you a couple different options here. This option here is basically I have already uh, selected my distal division point. I've already d sharply divided distally. I'm now sharply dividing proximally. And this is one of very many ways to do this operation. <clears throat> Transanally then placing the EEA stapler up. Hold at three points on the rectum, allows you to pretty well dilate the rectum up to pull the specimen out. Now, this is one of about 50 different ways to get the specimen out transanally.
<clears throat> and, then, and then the securement of the anvil. There's another 20 different ways to do this. I'm going to show two right now. One in which you simply hold up in a, in a, um, in a kind of a bimodal distribution, north and south. This is an endo loop securement. I'm going to fast forward in the interest of time. Endo loop um, securement of this, both, both proximally, and endo loop securement of the anvil distally. But holding at three points is critical for this to happen. I'll tell you with this technique, it's a little painful because you end up getting a lot of extra tissue. So you really, really, really got to end up trimming off. So this is one way to do it. I like it. It's actually beautiful because you have no overlapping staple lines, but it does take a little bit of uh, um, trimming at the end. The other way that I like to do it, and this is how I prefer to do it, is doing a running purse string suture with a 3-0 V-lock suture on a V-20 needle, where I'll start at the 7 o'clock position, run it as a baseball from in to out, in to out, in to out, all the way around, until you can get the anvil fast forward, secured, and I always leave the anvil, sorry, the suture attached, so that once I'm done, I'll back it up just a touch, <clears throat> Once you're done, you have, if you have ticks or anything in the astomosis that you need to clear off, you can have a much clearer landing zone to facilitate a beautiful anastomosis. So when it comes to doing these astomoses, there's, there's multiple ways to do it. These are just two of the many, many, many different ways to get this operation done. Okay, in just about 10 minutes and 30 seconds, I covered the 21 steps of doing a left hemicolectomy or sigmoid colectomy. And, uh, and here it is in, in its glory. And feel free to download it from this QR code. I thank you for the privilege of this podium. Thank you.